Welcome back to the Foreign Desk with Lisa Daftari podcast. I don't know about you, but it's quite often these days that I stop and say, how did we get here? And I'm seeing it all over from social media to how we view the police, to how professional athletes have hijacked their platform in the name of social justice, but just spewing hatred for our government and law enforcement to foreign policy, where a large segment of our population and lawmakers trust the government of China over our own or defend the regime in Iran who executes its own for a mere Facebook post. American lawmakers are counting down the minutes to cozy back down with the mullahs of Iran. How did we get here? How did we get to a place where social media platforms who profit from all political affiliations decide that posts smearing one candidate should or should not be censored, or worse, that the message from Twitter these days is so clear? Terrorists, yes. Trumpets, no. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The damage we're seeing to our nation, to the lack of patriotism among the youth, to the death of professionalism in journalism, to a disrespect for law enforcement, the president, all others. This will far outlast this, this president's four or eight years in office. Instead of looking at the real threats that should unite us as a nation, as it did after 9-11, we're looking at each other to find the enemy within. As I take a walk in my neighborhood, it's the masked walkers against the non-masked walkers. Among parents, it's those in favor of opening schools to those who are against it. But wait, are we still talking about COVID? No. These differentiations and divisions among Americans has very little to do with COVID and much more to do with a myopic vision for our nation, a vision that is so narrow in scope, it looks past the most important issues today. Protecting our nation, building our nation, our economy, our cyber capabilities, while we're putting everything on hold to play cheerleader for our teams, we're appealing vulnerable and divided before the world stage, and that is what will far outlast this political game we're in. To break this down and discuss the most significant global threats right now, let's bring in James Carafano, Vice President of the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage, Heritage Foundation and a foreign policy and national security expert, worldwide renowned and one of my favorites. Welcome to the show, Jim. Hello, my friend. Great to be with you and, and really an honor. You, I love the foreign desk. I love what you do. So really a, a privilege to be with you today. Thank you. And thank you so much for all of your work. And, you know, this summarizes it the best on your Twitter bio. It says Heritage, Heritage Foundation guy trying to prevent World War Three one tweet at a time, which I love. So how are you doing with that endeavor, Jim? Well, you know, I loved your intro. Uh, I thought you really captured well kind of the state of angst in America today. But, you know, in part as a historian and in part just having lived a long time, we, we've seen these periods in our history where we've literally been at each other's throat. And we're not talking about the Civil War. You go back to the hotly contested election of 1800 or the 1960s when literally every American campus was on fire. Uh, even kind of the, the, the uh, Iraq period uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and then the uh, anti-war demonstrations. So we, we ride this roller coaster all the time. What's very important as we do that is if you are the person in the White House, you have this enormous responsibility to look past all that, to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, because in your mind is you have to continually say, what can we do to protect the American pe people and their interests around the world? The reality is today is America is a global power with global interests and responsibilities, just who we are. We're not the world's policemen. We just happen to be a, a, a country that has a lot of very important interests and we have to look after our citizens and their interests around the world. And the challenge is how do we efficaciously do that? So, you know, and you know this because you're a professional and you deal with this all the time, kind of the term of art we use is, is great power competition. And which I, although these aren't all great powers we're concerned about, but I actually think it captures the issue very well. And what I often like to point out to people is if you look at Bush, Obama, and Trump, they all have the same bad guy list. I mean, they're worried about transnational terrorism, but it was Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. And of course, they had other things on their list. You know, Bush obsessed about uh, Saddam Hussein, Obama worried about climate change, Trump puts a lot of attention on the border, and they had different ways of dealing with these issues. But the fact that you had three American presidents, very different, two different political parties, over that period of time, it's the first time since the Cold War where we have this common conception of what's really important to America. 
dealing with these powers and ensuring peace and stability in the key parts of the world that link us together. Stable Western Europe, a stable greater Middle East, a stable Indo-Pacific. So um, I, I think it's interesting that, that we had a president who came into office who maybe is not a professional politician or a statesman, but who locked onto the importance of, of those realities and those objectives. And his, his foreign policy is actually cued on that. And if we put all the rhetoric and yelling each other aside and we just objectively look around the world, the reality is, is we are, our interests are better protected today than they were four years ago. Um, our enemies are challenged in a way that they haven't been in decades. And even from the perspective of our friends and allies, and of course, this is often a criticism of this administration is, oh, the, it's America first, they abandon friends and allies, you know, it's all transactional. If you look at the reality of that, everywhere our relationships are actually stronger. Indo-Pacific, all the key democracies, Japan, India, Australia, United States, working more closely together. The greater Middle East, we have this revolution, the normalization between the Arab states and Israel, bringing countries together to stand against Iran, stronger. Um, Latin America, this president has much better relations with Central America, Mexico, and Brazil, all the key players, than either of the past two presidents. Even in Africa, this administration has been more forward-leaning than the past presidents. And in Western Europe, which is kind of often the, the root of this criticism, uh, relationships with the Nordic countries, stronger. Baltic countries, stronger. Central European, better. Southern Europe, better. It's really kind of old Europe, France, Netherlands, Germany, but the, these countries, uh, and, and many of that is really has much to do about their own challenges and internal disagreements. Uh, and, and really just using kind of Trump hating as an excuse. So the reality is we are better off than we were four years ago. Our enemies are more greatly challenged uh, and our friends and allies actually look more to America than they did four years ago. Yeah, I, I definitely have to agree with you there. And I think I, I always kid around about this and I say I cover national security, but now I'm covering domestic stories because the national security threats are here. <laughs> They're not like you said, everywhere else. We're doing a great job. The president, I should say, is doing a great job um, at minimizing those threats. But we'll come back to uh, the, the crises here in the United States. I want to take you around the world, aerial view. What would you say are still um, some of the greatest threats to our nation. Right, so number one has to be China. And, and part of the reason for that is, you know, in contrast with Iran, North Korea, and Russia, China has a lot of cards to play. I mean, Russia is, quite honestly, they're struggling to preserve uh, influence in Belarus, which is a nation on their, their own front door. Uh, they're bogged down in this conflict with Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, they have got enormous domestic problems. Russia is really kind of struggling to hold its own. It's going nowhere in the Middle East. Um, Iran, Iran is near bankrupt. Uh, mm -hmm. It's never been under as much pressure as it's ever been. Uh, North Korea, of course, is, has been the quietest been in, in, in many years. China, in contrast, has a lot of resources, a lot of money, and a lot of influence. So China gets a vote in how competition in the future goes. And, and certainly, dealing with China is going to be kind of the pace setting uh, challenge for, for the United States for, for years to come. Yeah, I want to go dive a little deeper into China. Um, how would you rate uh, how Donald Trump dealt with China before COVID um, in, the, in the beginning of his presidency through March? And how would you deal with them now? Well, I, look, I got to say, and of course, this is not a partisan comment because I'm not a partisan guy. I don't even belong to a political party. Um, and I, I work in a nonpartisan think tank. I mean, this is, uh, you know, objectively speaking, I think this administration's strategy has been exactly right. It has really been the inverse of the strategy that we've practiced really almost for decades. I call it like it's the, the Blazing Saddle strategy. The old strategy was, is, remember, there's a character in that movie, Blazing Saddle, Mongo, and he's this big mean guy who's a, actually a, Detroit, uh, former Detroit lineman. And the, the line was, don't shoot Mongo because you might make him mad. And that was pretty much how we treated China. Yeah. President said, look, let's not antagonize the Chinese. Let's not challenge them. You know, as they'll rise, they'll become a normal nation and, and everything will be fine. And so we tried to accommodate and we ignored the frictions. And actually what that did is it enabled the Chinese 
and, and it, in some ways encouraged them to be more aggressive. And so when President Trump really came in, he didn't he flip that proposition on his head. He goes, no, 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 no. Let's not avoid confrontation with China. Let's seek confrontation with China and let's do it across the board, political, economic, military, diplomatic, mm -hmm. because then we will show the Chinese where our interests are and that we are willing to defend them. And then we will force the Chinese to adapt to us. And I think that's exactly right. And, you know, certainly China has not been cowed. I wouldn't argue that. But if you look across the board, China has never been challenged in, in decades the way it has in the last four years. And that has had material benefits. There's a reason why countries like Japan, Australia, and India want to work more closely with the United States. They see the United States as a powerful force for stabilizing the, the, the Indo-Pacific. And they see that working with the United States is the best way to do that. So clearly, I think the US strategy is exactly right. It, it, look, it, it doesn't solve the problem of China. Um, the, the Chinese can continue to be aggressive and cheat and lie and steal and everything else. But what it does do is it, it demonstrates to the Chinese that we're gonna protect our interests and it limits the malicious influence they have in the world. And it pulls allies and friends together to help push back on that. Right. So I, I have to use the same words. And I was just going to say, I need to push back on that. And I would just play devil's advocate to say, well, there's a reason you don't mess with the Chinese. And, you know, we've been living that for the last six or seven months. Oh, well, look, definitely um, the, the, the Chinese, in a sense, are the, the authors of their own problems. You know, for years, they just said, hey, we're, you know, we don't know what people are concerned about. We're just a nice, quiet, rising power. We don't get involved in other people's foreign policy or influence them, which was a complete lie. And and I, I think what really brought that lie to the fore was really COVID-19. You know, the reality is, is China is responsible for the global pandemic. That is indisputable. They knew the disease was highly contagious. They let people leave the country knowing it's highly contagious and it was likely to spread the disease globally. And they didn't share that information with the world. There's a global pandemic because of China. There's no question about that. And when people started to call them out on that and push back, the Chinese response to that was, look, this has never happened to us before. You know, people have never kind of pushed back on China. And it's been interesting watching them try to accommodate to that. So, so in some areas, they've, they've called what's called wolf, wolf warrior diplomacy. So wolf warrior is a series of very popular films in China about a Chinese secret agent that runs around the world and he's fighting mercenaries. And it just always the mercenaries are kind of backed by evil capitalists, you know, probably Americans. Um, they tried this very aggressive diplomacy, browbeating countries, threatening countries, uh, bribing countries, um, trying to cajole them, say, we'll, we'll give, we'll sell you personal protective equipment, but you have to say nice things about us if we do mm -hmm. that. Um, this is, I think, really changed the dynamic in the world. The world, I think, has really woken up to Chinese malicious behavior. Um, the way they treated Hong Kong, violating the basic law, an obligation to their own people. Uh, I, I think that's gotten a lot of people's attention. So I, I think Trump's stance was the right one. And I think what China has done in the last year in their kind of aggression uh, and duplicitousness has actually helped the president make the case that China is not just a, a challenge for the United States. It's really a global challenge. It's a global threat to stability and, and prosperity. Yeah, but yet you have, you know, half this country, I mean, I, and I say that, you know, uh, obviously overgeneralizing, but you have the likes of Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, you know, coming out in front and saying, we're not going to blame China for this. This is our president's fault. I mean, how damaging is that on the world stage? Well, this is the kind of, you know, the, kind of the sad reality of modern, po modern politics. I mean, you're a foreign policy expert, so you know this very well. You know, during the Cold War, we did at least have some, you know, unified, uh, unit, unit pulling us together. You know, they used to say, foreign, you know, politics ends at the water's edge. So this notion is, yeah, we can play our politics against each other, but when it comes to dealing with threats from overseas, like the Soviet Union and communism, we need to pull together as an American people and speak with one voice. That doesn't happen now. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, essentially, you know, trying to find a way to blame the president for the virus because it's politically expedient and letting China off the hook for that, that's horrible. Or what you hear, you know, with 
the National Basketball Association refusing to criticize China for their literally unbelievable human rights abuses. I mean, it, it is, I cannot tell you how unbelievably uh, wrong it is for the National Basketball Association to pretend that, that they are the great proponents of human rights and they support racial equality in, in the United States and everything. And yet they're, they are silent on one of their biggest customers, China, which has the most abysmal human rights record in the world today. Um, many people argue it's a, a genocide against the Muslim Uyghurs, millions of people put in camp, forced sterilization, uh, slave labor camps. I mean, unbelievably horrific behavior and, and a, a government which is actually quite racist. I mean, if mm -hmm. they, they are not, I mean, they're, they can actually be racist. I mean, uh, the worst kind of behavior you could possibly imagine. And yet the National Basketball Association is willing to ignore that behavior uh, and then claim that somehow they are great proponents of, of human rights and racial equality. So you, you're right. I mean, I, something I wonder how people can you know wake up at themselves and in the morning and look themselves in the mirror where we have these clear and present dangers to our national security and our interests and and people are more interested in squabbling for political power in Washington now having said that I would say and even though the they all well, we hate Trump and everything else, you get 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 all these folks in a room close the door politics aside and you ask them is China a challenge Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, they'll say yes. Is do we have to make sure Russia is not a threat? Yes. You know, do we want a peaceful Middle East? Does anybody think Iran is a good actor? Nobody does. And so they're actually the dirty little secret. Don't tell anybody. So I hope you don't have any listeners on your podcast. Um, the dirty little secret is, is there's actually a fair amount of bipartisanship on these global threats, but you would never know about it because politicians do exactly what you said. They're, they're, they're more interested publicly and in say, how can I score points against the president rather than say, how can we pull together as a political class, as leaders of this country to let Americans know that, yes, we need to work to keep America free, safe and prosperous from China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, transnational terrorists and these, these other threats. Right. And I think the same goes for Iran and the Iranian threat and how, you know, we have segments of the population and, of course, lawmakers on the left wanting to play kumbaya with Iran once again. I mean, looking past all of the inconvenient truths about their weapons program, their human rights abuses that are, are, are truly egregious. I mean, you can post on Instagram and be arrested and, and, and subsequently be uh, executed for, for something like that. And yet, just like you said, you have individuals who are proponents of women's rights and for gays who are hanged in Iran. And how how do we reconcile this? I mean, how do we bring them around to say, you know, you, they're a rogue player. And like you said, if you take them to a room and they can acknowledge that, how, come, how did foreign policy become such a divided issue here? Well, I think the most important thing to do is is do like the president's done, which is, I'm not talking about the tweeting and the speeches and everything else, but the actual execution of foreign policy, the actions that America takes, that you focus on making sure that those are the right, strong actions for this country. So this, Iran's a very good example. This administration has done so much to push back on the Iranian regime, not the Iranian people, but the Iranian regime, which is the chief source of destabilizing activities in the Middle East, and they, have, and they have gotten nothing but criticism for it and attacks and abuse. And the reality is, is this is literally the Lord's work. And Iran, as you well know, it, Iran is not just a regional problem. Iran's really a global threat in, in a number of different ways. You know, clearly it is a threat, first of all, to the Iranian people. It is corrupt, abusive, uh, and one of the world's leading human rights violators. Uh, in the region, they, they foment wars, they pay insurgencies, uh, they fund terrorists, they try to undermine their neighbors. Nobody questions that, but it's, it's bigger than that and, and twofold. One is the nuclear threat. I think people often talk, so, you know, we, why don't we want Iran to have a nuclear weapon? Well, it's not just if Iran had a nuclear weapon, because realistically, okay, the, Iran's never going to have a nuclear arsenal that comes close to something like the United States or 
China or Russia or even maybe really can match Israel. But the everybody believes, and, and the regional actors will tell you this, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, then it's, it's very likely that Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Egypt will compel, well, we have to have nuclear weapons too. That is incredibly destabilizing to have all those nuclear powers facing off in the Middle East. We've never had anything like that. Proliferation is a, and, and once proliferation starts, if people start shooting weapons, who knows where that ends? So the nuclear challenge of a, a proliferated Middle East and of a nuclear run is really a global threat. And for that reason alone, God bless the United States for taking that seriously. But it's more than that. I mean, Iran's hands and fingers are globally. How, you know, the Europeans are here trying to defend the Iran deal. How many terrorist attacks mm -hmm. have we seen the Iranians plot in Western Europe, including Germany, where if they had been successful, they would have killed hundreds of people. You know, even in the United States, uh, you know, as you well know, um, the Iranians contracted out to try to have somebody take a bomb and blow up the Saudi ambassador. The restaurant that they were going to blow him up in, that's a little restaurant in Georgetown right by my house that I go to all the time. So, you know, I could have been in the Iranian crosshairs. So Iran is a, is a global menace. And, you know, the United States did the hard things to push back on that regime. And, uh, and they get no credit for it. But w what's important is they do it anyway. And they do it because it's the right thing to do. And I think um, the one thing we've learned about this administration, uh, when they say America's first, it really, uh, it's not about America to the exclusion of our friends and allies or whatever. Uh, it's not about abandoning the world. It's not about isolationism. It's the president's commitment to say, first and foremost, I will look after and protect the interests of America. uh, Americans. And he's done that for four years. And uh, it's hard to argue that that hasn't worked. Now, we have a uh, vice presidential candidate who will uh, absolutely disagree with everything you just said. I want you to take a listen to what uh, Kamala Harris had to say at the vice presidential debates just last week. He has walked away from agreements. You can talk, look at the Iran nuclear deal, which now has put us in a position where we are less safe because they are building up what might end up being a significant nuclear arsenal. We were in that deal, guys. We were in the Iran nuclear deal with friends, with allies around the country. And because of Donald Trump's unilateral approach to foreign policy, coupled with his isolationism, he pulled us out and has made America less safe. <laughs> she says we are actually less safe, meaning that that meaning, meaningless piece of paper, that, that what was keeping us safe from a nuclear Iran. And then, she says he pulled us out, making references to pulling out of not only the nuclear deal, but of Syria and Iraq. I mean, first they said this guy was going to be a warmonger, and he wasn't. And they were disappointed that, that he wasn't a warmonger because now he was pulling us out of Syria and Iraq. And all of a sudden they were, are we pulling out prematurely? Is this a good idea? And now the nuclear deal. It sounds like the first day they would take office, if they should take office, they will jump right back in. Well, there, look, so there's there's two problems with any defense of the Iran deal. The one is fundamentally, and it, from the way it was created, the Iran deal never prevented Iran from potentially having a nuclear weapons program. It, it didn't do that. It, it allowed them to continue to enrich uranium, to continue to build out the infrastructure and capability to do that. It did nothing to address their ballistic missile program, which it's a big part of having a nuclear weapon is a missile to shoot it off of. So the, the, the lie about the deal is that it actually dismantled or prevented an Iran nuclear weapons program. It, it didn't do that from its inception. So that's wrong. The other thing is, is we now have so much evidence, most of it connect, collected by the Israelis, that throughout the space of the Iran deal, the Iranians cheated on the deal and they continued nuclear research they continue things which should now enable them to build out a weapons program and bomb. So they, they cheated anyway. And and even if they wanted to go back to the Iran deal tomorrow, what are they going to do about all the cheating, which which even the International Atomic Energy Agency has, has recognized? So the notion that somehow the Iran deal prevented Iran from getting a nuclear weapon is demonstrably false. I mean, that's proven with facts. So we could just put that aside because it's just an incorrect statement to say 
the Iran deal solve the worry about Iran being a nuclear threat? Because it's just not true. It's just factually not supportable. Um, the, the isolation argument I, I do find almost laughable on its face because there's zero evidence. You know, isolationism means you know, basically taking all your balls and going home. There's not one theater in the world where anyone can demonstrably prove that we've done that. Even where the president said, hey, I want to get the troops out of Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Today, what do we have? Troops in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Why are they there? Because the Joint Chiefs of Staff went back to the president and said, there's a reason to keep some of these forces here mm -hmm. to protect U.S. interests. And the president said, great, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, you know, the, recently we had this announcement to move some troops out of Germany. And of course, everybody said, ah, oh, here it is again, the president's abandoning NATO. N nobody looked at the facts of that. First of all, half of those troops were Air Force troops. And the Air Force decision just actually just was just common sense. We had a, an air base with one wing on it, incredibly inefficient and expensive. Uh, and what they did is they, they took those assets they moved them to Southern Europe, where we actually needed more air assets anyway to counter Russia. And then they took the other ones and they put them in the UK, which is way more efficient. So they didn't even leave Europe. We didn't withdraw anything. We actually made our contribution to NATO air assets more effective and more cost effective. The other one was well, we have a ground troop there called the Cavalry Squadron. We, the notion is we take, we really want troops more forward in places like Poland and and. and and the Baltic states, there isn't the infrastructure really to support that. So the idea is, well, well, we can rotate troops forward. And the decision was made, well, we'll bring them back to the United States and rotate them forward to Europe, which I actually think is a, not the right way to do that. Uh, I, I'd actually say better off leaving them in Germany and rotating them forward. But that's a, that's a, that's a technical, tactical decision. That, that's not about isolationism. So the, the problem with the whole isolation argument is, is there's no isolation that you could prove of. Even international organizations, a lot of people don't know this, but over the course of Trump's presidency, he's probably signed almost as many international agreements as Barack Obama did in his first term. The president's not against, we're not against international or multinational organizations. We, we just don't see the value in participating in ones that don't work and we can't fix. So for example, the president has been an enthusiastic supporter of NATO um, and, and he's actually made NATO much, much stronger that everybody's increased their contributions. Um, NATO's better off for the president's efforts. Even even the leader of NATO would tell you that. And uh, when you look at the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization failed us. Everybody agreed with that. Mm -hmm. The United States went back to the World Health Organization and said, look, you need to fix this. They refused to do that. So we left. And, it, and that doesn't mean the United States is abandoning global public health. The U.S. just set up a, a, an initiative with Africa to do public health in Africa the right way to replace all the things that the WHO isn't doing. Uh, in other cases, there's a thing called the World International Property Organization. So this is the UN organization that coordinates patents worldwide. China wanted to, had a candidate to be the head. So think about that. The world's leading thief of intellectual property wanted to be the head of the organization that protects international property. So the US actually led a global campaign to make sure that that candidate did not get elected. So you don't see the U.S. withdrawing from the world stage. You see the U.S. either reforming, replacing, or withdrawing from things that don't work. Even you know climate change, I think, is the penultimate example. Everybody complains that the United States uh, left the, the Paris Agreement. The United States has had the greatest reduction in CO2 emissions since leaving the agreement. We actually lead the world in CO2 emission reductions. So. These are very kind of vacuous, you know, flaccid criticisms of the administration that don't bother to go into the details of what the government is actually doing. Nobody wants to do anything more than argue about the president's last tweet. Right.
And I think that's exactly what he campaigned on, right? Pulling out of all these acronym groups that do nothing. Uh, to your point, just this week, the UN Human Rights Council elected um, members like Saudi Arabia and um, Iran and you know other other rogue players who have you know who, who are, are committing the human rights abuses to be part of that body. It's no, I mean, it just justifies why President Trump withdrew from that body as well. Um, you know, I speak to so many people around the world and. What they always tell me is my people love Donald Trump and the reason they love him is almost always the same. It's that he does what he says he will do. And it's so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear that because I think all around the world you have leaders, whether locally or, you know, on, on a larger scale, promising things that they, that they won't do. Um, and I think one of the best examples of, of doing what he said he will do is attempting, and I say attempting because it is probably the most Herculean feat of all foreign policy challenges is to bring peace to the Middle East. And you know, when you're watching the the unfolding of the Abraham Accords, you're watching other countries become signatory to this. This is the real Arab Spring. I've been calling it that since day one. The real Arab Spring because the the box that we were, we were all trapped in, um, you know, experts and and lawmakers alike, is that the obstacle to creating peace in the Middle East lays only with the Palestinians and the Israelis. And if we can't get that, we won't have peace in the Middle East. And Jared Kushner and President Trump figured out a way to bypass that and go straight to what will drive the future of the Middle East. And that's prosperity and economic opportunity. Uh, and you have a generation of young people who want to sign on to that. They want a COVID vaccine. They want to get new apps from Israel. They want to have that uh, the ability to move forward. And if the Palestinians don't want to move forward, well, they're going to step over them and, and move forward um, just the same. And, um, you know, I want to ask you about, well, how, you know, draw a picture for us, because I don't think the media has, has they've chosen not to capture the, the significance of the Abraham Accords. You know, how significant is this for the future of the Middle East? And in terms of foreign policy moves in the past decade, how would you rate this? Yeah. So first of all, we, we, we should say, and you're absolutely correct, it is transformative in Middle East policy. So there have always been two assumptions which kind of limited the speed at which diplomacy could go in the Middle East. Like like the, the you know, the there's a bar so that, you know, like the, tr the train can only go so fast down the track. And they were that nothing can happen in the Middle East until there's a deal between the Palestinians and the Israelis, nothing, right? Everything, you heard John Kerry famously say this, nothing can happen until it happens. And the other presumption was, and for that to happen, the U.S. has to be a totally neutral par partner. They can't favor the Israelis and they can't favor the Palestinians. They've got to be neutral. And Trump came in and said, look, OK, those are the rules of the road. We've been following those rules for like 30 years now. And what, how much progress have we made? None. So he goes, why do I have to believe that these assumptions are correct? And what I think is important about this, and, and, and very few people have written, nobody's really written on this, is... The president just didn't go out and say, okay, we're going to do the opposite, right? He, he didn't do like the little kid who said, let me throw a match in the garage and see if it burns down. He challenged those assumptions in a risk-informed way, right? He did things to test to see whether they were true or not. And the first one was moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Remember, everybody said the, the, the Middle East will burn down, the Arab street will rise up if you move the embassy. So he moved the embassy and nothing happened. And then, of course, then he recognize Israeli ownership over the Golan Heights. And again, everybody said the world would come to an end. Nothing happened. Then he put a peace deal on the table. They said, oh, you can't put a peace deal on the table without the Palestinians, you know, signing off. And he did it anyway. And nothing happened. And this demonstrated not just to his own government, but to the countries in the region that no, that we do not all have to wait on the Palestinians because the great error there was essentially under those rules, the Palestinian Authority had a veto over everything. And the Palestinian Authority has no interest in peace. They don't profit from it. It does, it does them no good. They don't make more money off of it. it doesn't give them more power. They're the losers because if there's peace, who needs them? So, of, of course, the president said it's ridiculous that we're all waiting on them when they're the last people that want peace. And so here, so this essentially broke open the log jab to all kinds of new opportunities. And there were two things about this, and, and you touched on both of them. Um, 
you always impress me because you really your grasp on foreign policy is so so spot on one of course is the security thing which you mentioned right the, everybody's worried about iran and what this does is it allows these countries to start to collectively work together to deal with the iranian threat and that's huge so i'll give you an easy example missile defense right iran's got a lot of missiles they can shoot them in everybody everybody's got missile defenses but there think of the difference between if you're standing out in the rain with your umbrella and every as opposed to everybody in the street getting together and linking their umbrellas together then no rain falls right the key to missile defense is when you start to network other people's sensors and defenses you build up a much more robust defense system and that's that's bad news for iran so collective security that's that is the one thing iran does not want it wants to do divide and conquer so creating the foundation for real collective security in the region that's Iran's worst nightmare. And you very perceptively mentioned the other one, which I think nobody really talks about. And that's the, the potential for economic integration. There hasn't been true economic integration in the Middle East since the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and here you have an opportunity to link together economies, tourism, travel, energy, digital. That's going to create wealth. Uh, and for a bunch of oil countries, which recognize that all their money is not going to come from oil forever, who are desperately looking for ways to diversify their economy from a region that's been desperate for job growth, creating jobs for young Arabs forever, uh, that's been looking for ways to create more prosperity, more economic growth, uh, better governance. This is going to enable all of that. And of course, that's another big block to Iran. No, nobody, nobody's going to want to be a suburb of Tehran if they are safe and free and prosperous. Mm -hmm. the, the, the significance of this transformation and the path the president has put us on is, is unbelievable. And, and oh, God, God only hopes that regardless of who wins the election, that we continue down this path because it is. But, it, but it, it goes back to the president's fundamental strategy, which is, look, the problem with the Middle East is we either jump in with both feet and try to fix everything and make it worse, or we try to run away like Obama did and we make it worse, right? Mm -hmm. And it looks like a giant sign curve, right? And the president says, you know what? Running away is stupid. But doing everybody's business for them is stupid. What we need to do is create a situation where we enable and empower these people to do things themselves. And we'll be there. We'll be a partner for you. But we're not going to do it for you. But we're also not going to abandon you. Right. And it's it's that balance, which I think creates for, for a first time a sustainable U.S. presence in the region, which is good for the region, is good for us, uh, doesn't require us to you know ring the place with aircraft carriers. But it also doesn't mean we're going to do stupid stuff like Obama and just wave, you know, you know, give Iran $150 billion, tell them to play nice and just, you know, go back and dig in the Rose Garden. Right. Absolutely. I think that's that's been the um, consistent, you know, path that the president has taken to incentivize. And I think from day one, isn't that what, you know, Americans voted for him for that reason? A businessman who would, you know, revamp this nation, get it back on its feet and and make it prosper. And here we are almost four years later where that's been forgotten. You know, to your point, when Jared Kushner and Donald Trump, well, Jared Kushner drove it to um, to present the, um, the the peace plan to the Palestinians who, who didn't even, it was dead on arrival. They didn't even show up to, to, to hear about it. Um, it was well received. And where was it hosted? In Bahrain, where so many Arab businessmen showed up um, to hear about it. And that was, you know, for me, that was just such a precursor to incentive incentivizing peace. And I think that that's exactly what the rest of the world is now understanding about Donald Trump and this, this administration and why it's so different from previous administrations and why he's not a politician and why that has benefited us. And that brings me to my last question. We are now at, um, you know, about a few weeks away from a very important election and the two candidates could not be any more different. And the two futures or the two paths that they set before us for the future of the United States could not be any more different. Just with regards to foreign policy, what would the major differences be between these two choices that we have? Well, I, I, I'm not so sure we're 100%. I mean, I think we know what a, a future Trump foreign policy would be. It would be the, the second half of the policy that he's doing now. You would get more, more of the same. I, I don't know. If even Biden knows what a Biden foreign policy would see, but and here's what I'll say: I um, here's my fervent hope because, at the end of the day, 
when you're defending America and you're not a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal or conservative, you're an American defending Americans. Here's my here's what I really, really hope. Um, I think what this administration has done is, is they looked at the past and they said, well, look, you know, as well-meaning as Bush may have been, the reality is, is, is 9-11, you know, changed everything. America, he said, here we are, the world's slow superpower. How can we let people come here and kill us? We need to make the world safer for America. And they had a very aggressive foreign policy that was, we're going to go out and solve all the problems. And I think the criticism, which, which I think is fair, is like, you know, they kind of created as many problems as they solved. The, you can't fix the world. The, the problem was, is the Obama administration came in and did the exact opposite. We, what we need to do is run away from all our problems. You know, give these guys what they want and just leave everybody. And the problem with that, of course, is you create gaps in space that the bad guys fill in, and that creates more problems. What the president has done is, is tried to be both a realist and be realistic. He said, look, the answer isn't to try to change the world and nation build everything and, you know, do regime change everywhere and, and be the world's policeman. That, that we can't, that's never going to work. This is also stupid to walk away from the world and, and let the problems come to your doorstep. We need to be present in the world, demonstrate our willingness to protect our interests. If we do that, like-minded nations will stand with us and will work together. And when we work together, we'll all carry the load better. That's this administration's policy. It's exactly the right foreign policy for the age of great power competition that we're in. I go to bed every night and I pray that who is ever the president in January 22nd or whatever, 2021, is that direction of foreign policy we stay on because that is working. Absolutely. And I go to bed knowing, uh, feeling safer that someone like you is working right down the street from the White House and affecting policy and putting out the right tone and the right words of, of analysis. And um, I thank you, Jim, for joining us. And for the rest of you who'd like to subscribe to my podcast, please go to um, youtube.com slash Lisa Daftari or to sign up for my daily top 10 emails, go to foreigndesknews.com slash newsletter and you can sign up there. Thank you so much. See you next time.